The first thing that comes into my mind when I think about Dark Souls is the feeling of trekking through a dimly lit cave, searching helplessly for a bonfire. I'm low on Estus, my will is nearly broken, and my sword is the same. I can hear the sickly, hissing, groaning sounds of enemies waiting to kill me ahead in the darkly lit path. I cautiously press forwards through a small section of this area. I'm unfamiliar with my surroundings, and I'm praying I don't get ambushed, fall off a ledge, or just die by my own stupidity. The several thousand souls I have on me, I desperately want to keep. I need these to level up, and I can't unless I get to a bonfire. Should I push on and risk everything? Or turn around back to the safety of those crackling flames and undo all the progress I just made? I have died at this exact spot before, and honestly, both options seem pretty shitty. I've turned back before, but this time, I decided to be brave and keep going. A few minutes later, I'm ambushed by black frogs and killed by their toxic gas. The game greets me with that old familiar, you died scream, and it takes me back to my last bonfire with no souls. I just barely remember how to get back to where I died, and if I perish again, I'll lose all of my souls for good. This feeling of dismay hits me. I'm shattered. How much time have I wasted? I ponder, annoyed and drained, and turn the game off. Later that night, I decide to give it another shot, and eventually I conquer this small section of Dark Souls 1. I kill the basilisk that ambushed me. It seemed like such a stupid thing. I could have avoided him so easy. There was another way around too. I guess I was just stubborn the first time. And after some more stumbling around, I reach my next checkpoint. A wave of relief crashes over me and I feel very happy. More than happy. I'm actually elated. This fearful sense of progress in Dark Souls 1 is what made the game so great. It's a process of breaking you down through failure and building confidence through your victories no matter how small they may be. Killing that little frog that ambushed me in that dark tunnel isn't a great feat, nor is making it through Sense Fortress or killing Quelog. But the point is that they are confidence boosters in a game that's very oppressive and very cryptic. Not to mention very, very difficult to get into. You begin Dark Souls as a shack but you get torn down into rubble over and over by this black knight and by the countless other dumb things like falling off ledges and being greedy for shiny white orbs on the ground. You might even die so much that you enter the realm of hysteria or rage. But then you go through a moment like I did in the depths where you slay your enemies, as corny as it may sound, and you make that iconic moment of progress. Not by some arbitrary progression system, not by the game telling you what to do or where to go or holding your hand through the dark until you win, but by you saying, fuck it, I am doing this, and this game will not stop me. Tell me another series that enables this mentality, because Dark Souls, as far as I'm concerned, forces you to dig deep and find the determination to keep going amidst your cries of anguish and despair. And that's not something you simply program into the code of a video game. You must be prepared to die, pick yourself off the ground, grit your teeth, and spend that last drop of hope inside of you to keep going. It's almost impossible to try to describe this feeling games like Dark Souls give you to people outside the gaming sphere without sounding absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's a game. Who cares? But to that I say, you just don't know Dark Souls, man. The psychology built around Dark Souls is unlike any other game I've played, and even 12 years later, I can say that that sensational feeling of struggling, overcoming, and feeling accomplished is 100% still there. Lots of games challenge the player with difficult situations, but few have the ability to make you actually fear failure. You don't fear death in Call of Duty, you just respawn. You fear death in Dark Souls because the repercussions are so terrible. You're not just dying in Dark Souls 1, but every death puts you in the character's post-mortem. You have to get back to your souls. There is no other option. The corpse runs in Dark Souls 1 are so tense because sometimes you'll actually get more lost to getting back to your body than you were when you died. It's terrible, but when you finally succeed, it feels incredible, because the tools you're working with are so limited and harsh. The game simply does not give you a lot of concessions. 
This is an Elden Ring where you can get a level 20 weapon, level your character to 5000 and find the best spells, consumables, and physics in the game by the time you get to the first boss. There's no endless free farming, no map, no giant world without restrictions. You just gotta suck in your nuts and do it. And that feeling of conquering such a beast of a game is so damn special. That first playthrough, a little bit thereafter, but it still remains at the heart of any DS1 playthrough. If not for the fundamental reason that the game is so tightly designed. The level design is flat out amazing because the world size is so small, yet it's with that limited space that they have made a completely revolving interconnected world that feels twice as big, if not three times as big as it actually is. And every playthrough can be a little bit different as you have multiple options for setting out, getting lost, looping back and forth, and having that iconic moments where you take an elevator back up to the only place you feel safe. Realizing that a giant underground system of caves and tunnels that you approach from a completely different point in the game world was actually underneath your feet in Firelink Shrine all along. But I would be lying if I said the gameplay held up to today's standards. Going back to Dark Souls 1 feels like going back and playing an old racing game from the late 90s. It is stiff. Very, very stiff. Broken down to the most fundamental game mechanics of a fighting game. You attack. You determine if it's safe to attack again. And if not, you block or back away. You might cast a spell here or there if you have them but the entire playthrough can be finished simply by hitting R1 when it's safe. Such a primitive combat system is likely not going to be enough for someone who, let's say, played Elden Ring and is curious if they'll now enjoy Dark Souls in the same way. I'm here to say that you won't. Mechanically, you won't, and systematically, you won't either. Elden Ring might have the DNA of Dark Souls, but it is not like this game at all. Attacks are slow and clunky, there's no fancy mechanics or combos or weapon arts. Options during combat include only a light attack, a heavy, a roll, and that's basically it. Dark Souls 1 is not based around rolling like Dark Souls 3 or Elden Ring. At best, you'll circle around enemies for backstabs. The AI in Dark Souls 1 allows for some extremely cheesy mechanics, but normally our options during fighting are extremely, extremely limited. You also incur much more block stun when using your shield, and you can't move freely when you're healing. Some enemies also incur this penalty, in addition to some hit stun, but the topic of poise is not something I'm going to talk about because I don't have a PhD in quantum physics. What were they thinking? The other two elements that differentiate Dark Souls 1 from the others are that when you drink an Estus, the animation locks you into place for a while, and that your stamina meter regenerates very slowly. These two things slow down the gameplay significantly, making combat feel very, very thoughtful. Dark Souls 1 is much more a game of baiting attacks and punishing whiff stuns, and dealing with environmental hazards while you do so than the endless rolling combo dodging in New From games. I'm of course speaking about tactics. Dark Souls 1 is a very tactical game. It's not very fast, and it's not very strategic. You don't go in with a plan and magically have everything turn out the way you thought it would. It's tactical. There's no preparation here. You determine what to do in the moment as things are happening to you using the limited tools you have restricted by the systems put in place by the game. Again, the combat speed, the stamina bar restrictions, and the environmental hazards. Which ways are safe to roll and what enemies are coming at you are way more important than any game mechanics in this game, all taking place within the confines of a very stiff game made in 2011. This is tactics, not strategy. Furthermore, there's no respecking, and upgrade materials are very hard to come by, so you're locked into the role that you choose. You just don't have a lot of options. Dark Souls progression system is set up that by the time you finish it, you'll be good at one thing with one weapon and one set of armor. You're not going to have an inventory full of creative options for play. One of the things that I had forgotten about Dark Souls 1 before I went back to it this year was that you could upgrade your armor. Dark Souls 3 and onwards gave fixed stats on armor like Bloodborne and Elden Ring, and you could not upgrade them. And here's the kicker, upgrading your armor in Dark Souls 1 uses Titanite shards, chunks, and slabs, which are the exact same resources for upgrading your weapons. Thus, character builds were incredibly specific and niche in Dark Souls 1. Whether you forge weapons or armor first, well, that's up to you. 
but nobody wants to see you go hollow. So whatever you do, you'd better do it well. <laughs> this trickles down into the fundamental progression of Dark Souls 1, which is souls. They're scarce, and even to this day, 12 years later, I sat there at the level up screen, groaning over and over to where to spend my souls. And that kind of inflexibility wasn't a downside, it was surprisingly a breath of fresh air. I like the idea that I'm playing a game that holds me accountable, and you are forced to make small decisions all the time in Dark Souls 1. Souls are the only way to level up your character. You lose them all the time. Everything is scarce. Humanities, souls, healing items, and more. You can't find a regeneration ring and play easy mode in Dark Souls 2. You don't have a million bonfires either. The game isn't linear. This is why Dark Souls 1 feels so damn exciting, even today. You're out there, unsure of your location, with a save point you can't even see, with enemies around every corner that will murder you. You're low on Estus, and you have to make a choice. Do I turn back and secure the bag, or do I continue and risk it all? It's a choice that is the fundamental heart of Dark Souls 1, and it's not a rare occurrence either. Constantly must you ask yourself that, at every corner, at every fork in the road, because simply the most important systems of progression all hinge on the ability for you not to lose your souls. Until you get to Anor Londo, there aren't great farming spots like there are in Elden Ring. And even then, it's not exactly fast. You want to farm skeletons in the Undead Parish? Cool, I'll see you in three weeks. No, if you want the real Souls experience, you play the game straight up, killing everything that's on your way. You trek through the tightly designed levels. You find bonfires, you eventually open the shortcut, and then you fight the boss. If you don't have enough potions to make it through, then you turn around and you do it better next time. Sure, you can run past enemies, and that's a flaw, but you'll find that flaw in every Souls-like game. But at the core, the essence of its progression does not change despite that, because that's the way the game encourages you to do it. You can't just use whatever you find. You can't just find whatever you want, and you can't just decide to be a spellcaster halfway through. The pyromancy flame needs to be upgraded with the same souls you normally level with, and sorceries scale with specific stats. You know, the stats you spend souls on to level vitality? Yeah, you can't be the jack of all trades like you can be in Elden Ring. And you can't have your cake and eat it too. You combine the wonderful world with NPCs that come and go, which makes the world feel alive, with the perfectly tuned stamina system, with the spiderweb world design, connecting it all in place, with the Estus system that you must constantly think about, the perfectly placed bonfires, the beautiful music, the fair challenge, and the sense of permanency to your choices. And this is why Dark Souls 1 today is still so good. And if there was ever something in Dark Souls 1 that doesn't get enough credit to, it is sound. The very first thing that stood out to me when going back to Dark Souls 1, after being every other From Software game, was that the game was so silent. The amount of music in Dark Souls would surprise you, and when exploring levels there is hardly any. The only things you hear are happening inside the game world. The sound of your footsteps, the clash of combat, the groans and mauls of enemies, and the ambience of the world. Like the sound of those crickets in Darkroot Garden, or the howling of winds atop the majestic castle of Anne Orlando. You can imagine standing right there, you'd be hearing that exact same thing, no less and no more than the hero himself. Most video games assault you with music, and it typically never ends. Engineers design games around the small attention spans of humans that demand constant stimulation to keep interested. This is in addition to the liberal use of screen objects like user interfaces, scrolling text effects, and on-screen pop-ups and maps. Think back to any game you've practically ever played and ask yourself one simple question. Has there ever been a moment where there wasn't some form of manufactured sounds beyond the simple music? In Dark Souls 1, at best you'll be serenaded by the crackling hum of a lonely bonfire, and that's pretty much your music. This is pretty much the opposite of playing Elden Ring or even Dark Souls 3, where areas generally have looping music. You! I... Well, let's just calm down. Talk about things. I did you wrong, but I didn't mean it. These temptations, they can, well, overcome me. You know what I mean, don't you? Please, forgive me. The absence of music has somewhat of an interesting effect on humans, as it tunes you in because, well, there's nothing else to concentrate on. 
Music easily distracts. Sounds, too. But the sounds in Dark Souls are very rhythmic because they're all diegetic. The crackling bonfires, the thud of chainmail boots on the ground, or the pounding of a blacksmith hammer. We're smashing a barrel into pieces. And these are sounds that every Dark Souls player will have ingrained in their mind. And they'll never forget them because the world is so otherwise so sonically barren. They contrast so loud against the quiet game world. Every block with your shield feels like a titanic sound effect because really, there are no other sound effects to speak of beyond the shrill death cries of your character and your foes. When the music kicks in, it's only in boss fights or at the shrine. The absolute and beautiful quietness allows for total concentration, which is one of the reasons why this game has been worshipped over a decade. When the game presents music though, it doesn't flood banging tunes in every boss fight, something that Dark Souls 2 probably could have learned from. A lot of the songs in Dark Souls 1 are actually quite gentle and natural, and most of them lack traditional instrumentation. The Moonlight Butterfly and Seaf themes are somber tunes driven mostly by a mysterious woman's hymns and musical synths. The ceaseless discharge theme is overwhelmed by a deep, chanting plain song of an unknown man. And the final boss track is a slow, melancholy piano song which serves to align the game's depressing thematic elements. Dark Souls 1 at the end of the day is still a very fun game today. Everything that was praised about it a decade ago is still true, no matter how many times you beat it. The heart of Dark Souls 1 revolutionized RPGs and action games forever, and the world crafting and building are undeniable at this point. Even though the combat is very shallow and cheesy, the game otherwise is still a joy to play. The only real bummer is that the first half of Dark Souls 1 is way, way better than the last. After Anna Orlando, the game takes a nosedive faster than a Boeing 747 going Mayday. Going to the Duke's Archives, the Crystal Cave, Demon Ruins, Lost Isolith, and Killing of the First Flame are just not good, no matter how you slice it. These areas are not even close as enjoyable as Parish, Depths, Sense Fortress, and Londo. You might even call them hot garbage because they seem unfinished as well. But overall, the game is still a masterpiece. It is dated, but it does feel like a good one at this point. It might feel terrible in 20 years, sort of like how playing Pitfall right now on the NES is a shit show. But you'll always be able to call it a masterpiece for its time, that's for sure. That one day an undead shall be chosen. <laughs>